Okay, so let's talk a little bit about our story skins by uh, Joseph uh, Bruchak. And a couple of things about uh, Joseph. Again, he is a um, both white and First Nations. Doesn't seem to have the same identity crisis that uh, the other authors, especially those homes from Hawaii, uh, have taken upon themselves. Um, he celebrates uh, all of his ancestry. He is also a, a PhD uh, professor in modern literature. And I suspect that our main character, uh, Mitch Sebatis in the story, uh, somehow connects to experiences that uh, Joseph uh, Ruchak encountered in his, his own life. So um, Ruchak is from Yankee Dumb. Uh, his First Nations cultural connections go to an Indian uh, group called the Abenaki. He does speak the language himself. He's a tribal member and uh, a great uh, storyteller. He's taken on the role of storyteller, which is important in the tribal uh, custom and lifestyle, passing down the information of the tribe, uh, educating their youth. Uh, so he's, uh, he's an active member in an actual First Nations uh, uh, tribe. Okay, so our story, uh, Skins, okay. The title says everything, one word. The title really just draws you in. You want to explore more. Okay, what is what is he talking about? Uh, skins is, is kind of, you know, it's kind of weird in a way, but uh, it's really an eye-catching piece, uh, a title, and it kind of draws you right in and wants you to, to read more. So, in the first paragraph, uh, Buchak really, uh, I found this to be really uh, unusual, the way he starts off the story. The first day I saw Jimmy T. Black, I thought he was a real Indian, realer than me. Okay, so, of course, that's totally uh, grammatically incorrect. Uh, there is uh, no word realer. Um, it's, uh, if you said that as an adult, uh, people would think you weren't very educated. So, uh, Mitch is the narrator of the story and all of a sudden he's, he's, playing around with the language, okay? Um, he's not, uh, he's not a, a, a stupid kid. He's actually uh, very intelligent, very well read. Uh, so he's just kind of playing, informally playing around with the language. Okay, so in the first paragraph, uh, we understand that uh, Jimmy T, uh, his middle name is uh, Thorpe, uh, relating to Jim Thorpe, the uh, Sack and Fox guy who won the Olympics about a century ago and was the world's greatest athlete. So I think in my introduction, I said that there's a statue for uh, Jim Thorpe in Upper State, New York, and that's not correct. The statue is at the football 
Hall of Fame, which is in uh, Ohio. So uh, Jim Thorpe, a uh, quick background on, on him. Uh, again, uh, a century ago, he was uh, actually a famous, uh, he's famous for football, but he also played uh, baseball. He was a uh, famous uh, runner, a track star, uh, a ballroom dancer, a pool player, anything to do with sports, uh, he w excelled in. And I don't think anybody's ever come close to uh, beating his records. And he was actually uh, half uh, First Nations and half uh, Caucasian. Okay, so the next character that's introduced into our story is uh, Uncle Tommy Fox. And uh, Uncle Tommy Fox is the um, father figure, uh, the teacher of the cultural aspects of uh, Indian culture, mythology, those kinds of things, to Mitch Sebatis. And we find out why a little later in the, in the story. Now, Uncle Tommy Fox had met Jim Thorpe when he was a kid. And Uncle Tommy Fox was also in the movies. And he was anonymous Indian number two or number three. So what that means is, is that in the movies, you've got the tribe of Indians on horses that are getting ready to uh, attack the stagecoach. And the stagecoach make the big circle to protect themselves and start shooting the attacking Indians. And Uncle Tommy Fox was one of those Indians on the horses that would be shot, and thrown off his horse, and, and dies. And uh, in the credits, they would say, okay, anonymous Indian number two or number three. But yeah, he, uh, he, he got to play in the movies a little bit when he was younger. So that's kind of the, uh, the start of our first page of our story. Okay, so in the uh, third paragraph, uh, this is called uh, an aside, which uh, in literature is uh, extra information that the, uh, the author interjects into the story that uh, is kind of background information. And what he says is, but the story isn't actually about Uncle Tommy even though he was sort of part of it. This all happened the autumn when Uncle Tommy was away visiting New Mexico. So I should get back to Jimmy T and also our high school, which is, of course, where I first met him. So that's called an aside. Authors do that. They interject uh, extra added information. Okay, so the after this introductory three paragraphs the the setting is uh, at long pond uh, central high school and uh this is a uh, uh what you'd call a a community uh high school where several towns in the area they're too small to have their own high school so uh, they send their kids to one central regional high school. So um, it's a really, really small town. And uh, it talks a lot about uh, sports. And sports in American high schools is uh, really big. A lot of money is spent on sports, uniforms, building fields, a stadium. Uh, I know when I traveled uh, throughout uh, Asia, 
sports was not considered uh, important in any kind of educational setting. The, uh, the most popular uh, kid in America is usually that uh, sports player. But in Asia, the, uh, it's the smartest kid in the school that's the most popular. Uh, I think Australia is another country that really emphasizes uh, sports playing as part of their educational curriculum. So why? Why is sports uh, so much part of American uh, culture? So the reason behind the sports uh, in education is to hopefully teach the player uh, teamwork, uh, leadership, uh, physical education, but the uh, main idea is to teach something called good sportsmanship. Maybe we say it's, it's not whether you win or lose the game, it's how you play the game. Okay, so sportsmanship is, is part of that underlying reason for why sports is so important in uh, school. So uh, he goes on to the, describe the small town. He says it's so small you have to look twice uh, when you travel through it. Uh, we say uh, if you blink your eyes you'll miss it. So um, he uh, talks a little bit about uh, in and I'm sure those of you who live in a uh, small community outside of uh, Debertson know this very well. You grew up there. Everybody knows your business. Everybody remembers what you did a hundred years ago. And he talks about a funny story when he, in elementary school, he bit some girl and they still talk about that story today. So this is all part of what life is like in a rural community. And people know everything about you, they know, uh, what you had for dinner last night and uh, uh, what time uh, you came home and uh, who you were hanging out with and you have no privacy and gossip is everywhere. So he kind of makes that analogy about his little small uh, town Long Pond. So um, he talks a little bit about uh, himself. Uh, he identifies as uh, First Nations, but uh, he's actually uh, half Swedish and half First Nations. And his hair color is uh, we call dirty blonde, which is uh, a mix of brown and blonde together. And he uh, dyes his hair black so that he can look more First Nations. Uh, he talks about his uh, mother, who uh, has a, a very uh, brilliant uh, blonde hair, uh, that kind of golden yellow blonde. And she's from uh, Sweden. Uh, he says that his mother could pass for Brunhilde. And uh, Brunhilde is a uh, Norse goddess. She is the one that uh, if you die on the battlefield, uh, she comes and takes your spirit to their heaven called uh, Valhalla. So uh, he makes a connection to his uh, his mother in that way. It's mentioned a couple times in the in the story. And uh, he talks a little bit about the seasons of uh, living up in uh, rural upper state New York. And uh, he says that uh, the, instead of four seasons, there's only three seasons. Uh, there is a black fly season, mosquito season, and thank God they're gone season. 
kind of funny. He, uh, one of the vocabulary words in that paragraph is uh, called the uh, flatlanders. And this is what people in the mountains call outsiders. It means you don't live in the mountains. You don't understand our cultural backdrop. You live in the valley or you live down in the flat farmland down below. And you're not one of us. Now, um, Long Pond area had an industry in the past uh, for wood, for making paper. But that industry is gone and it has uh, transformed itself into a, a tourist area where people go hunting and fishing and snowmobiling and probably skiing. And it, it's actually a very beautiful part of the, of the country. A lot of rivers and lakes and hiking. People do a lot of hiking there. So um, he introduces uh, the uh, new um, the new center that has uh, been built to accommodate uh, tourists coming to the area. And uh, that center is the stopping point for people traveling through. You'd go there, you get the uh, information, maybe get some maps where the hiking trails are or the best skiing place or where to go swimming and that sort of thing. So that becomes an important part to our story. Okay, so um, Joseph uh, Bruchek uh, uses a, almost uh, a page and a half just uh, setting the background scene before any uh, action takes place in our story. And we're, we're finally getting there. So it opens up in the uh, school uh, there are four new kids that uh, have arrived to start the new school year which is uh, unheard of maybe one every couple of years okay but four in one year he describes it as a tsunami which is a, a big hurricane a big storm um, people don't really know how to react uh, to so many new students uh, on the first day. So he uh, talks about uh, uh, Jimmy T. Uh, Black's uh, uh, introduction into the school. And uh, everybody wants to kind of get to know who this new student is he's got long black hair he dresses in a first nations uh, uh, custom way uh, with the turquoise uh, jewelry and uh, uh, a special vest that uh, first nations people wear very tall handsome guy of course all the girls are uh, already trying to find out who he is and that sort of thing and the he talks about the buzz around the school so that's the, the local gossip or what people are talking about about uh, this new student uh, jimmy t black and uh, come to find out he is a uh, well-known uh, quarterback uh, sports player for football and we find out that uh, many uh, newspaper articles have been uh, written about his playing at uh, his previous school he uh, is uh, being hunted uh, by some of the uh, big name uh, colleges uh, notre dame and syracuse where they're thinking about uh, after he graduates from high school, he can come play football for those college teams. And uh, he uh, has uh, made some analogies uh, 
between uh, Jimmy T. Black and some famous uh, people from uh, the past and the present. He says, uh, a good quarterback was like Moses and Eminem. So Moses is an old biblical uh, leader. Uh, and uh, Eminem is, uh, at the time that the story is uh, being written about, uh, was a famous uh, uh, pop uh, singer. Uh, the girls think he kind of looks like uh, Enrique Iglesias, which is uh, another famous uh, music singer. And uh, Mitch says, uh, to me, Jimmy T looked like a dead ringer for the Indian guy in Dances with Wolves. You know, the one who calls out at the end, Dances with wolves, you'll always be my friend. So, Dances with Wolves is a uh, famous uh, Academy Award winning uh, movie. It came out in 1990. It was uh, written uh, and directed by Kev and starred uh, Kevin Costner, a famous American. Uh, film star. And it's about a uh, soldier, an officer in the Union Army during the Civil War who gets uh, wounded. And because of his uh, brave actions, he uh, has the choice to go anywhere in the United States to finish out his military career. And he uh, goes under the name of Lieutenant Dunbar. So Lieutenant Dunbar uh, decides that he wants to go out to the West and see uh, First Nations uh, indigenous life before it's all gone, which he does. So he, um, uh, goes to a fort. There's nobody there. He's by himself. Can't, nobody knows what happened to the soldiers that were there before. They're all gone. He, uh, establishes himself there as a home base. Uh, the story goes on and he eventually meets up with the, uh, local, uh, Lakota, uh, Indian tribe. Long story short, he uh, he becomes a member of the tribe, uh, gives up his post uh, in the military. And uh, of course that doesn't please the military at all. They uh, find out that he's left his post and that's a jailable offense. You can go to prison for that. So they chase him across the countryside looking for him. Uh, the final scene is there up in the mountains and his, uh, First Nations friend, of course, at, in the story, they weren't friends, but they became friends at the end, uh, is up on a mountain looking down at, uh, Lieutenant Dunbar and, uh, Lieutenant Dunbar has to leave because the cavalry is getting closer. And uh, that uh, movie star that uh, Jimmy T looks like uh, yells uh, from the mountain, uh, Chumani Tutanka, Owani, Chumani Tutanka, Owani, which means uh, dances with wolves, you always be my friend. So, um, if you have a chance to see the movie Dances with Wolves, it's a great story. A lot of uh, controversy uh, in the story. And uh, Mitch Sebatis uh, talks a little bit about that uh, in the next paragraph. And the funny part of the story is, is that um, this movie won uh, awards for being the first 
movie to use uh, indigenous language in the film. So the, the Indians are speaking their native language and Lieutenant Dunbar learns some of the, the language through the film. And he uh, had a, a trainer, a language trainer in Lakota that taught him uh, how to speak. And the uh, teacher was a, a woman. And in the Lakota language, the, there are two uh, forms of speaking, one male, and one female. And what he was speaking in the movie is actually the female uh, voice uh, and language and not a male uh, language of Lakota. Uh, he talks about uh, Lieutenant Dunbar finds the buffalo before the uh, Indians do. And that's just crazy. He says, uh, I mean, uh, get real. I mean, come on. That would never happen. Now, um, the movie uh, is uh, controversial in another way. Uh, we talked about the noble savage uh, in last week's uh, lesson. And this uh, movie story is uh, compared uh, to being uh, that of the uh, expressing the idea of the, the noble savage. So uh, it's great entertainment. Uh, First Nations peoples uh, don't really like the movie because of that noble savage uh, idea. Uh, but uh, again, it did win uh, many awards uh, and it was the first uh, film to use uh, indigenous language as part of the script. Okay. So um, he, Mitch Sebatis is really uh, introspective uh, about himself. Uh, he's, he calls it uh, hanging back. And hanging back is when you don't go out there and make a big show of yourself. You kind of wait, you observe. You think about things before you uh, take any action. And that's uh, the personality trait of uh, Mitch Sebatis. Uh, not only in a social setting, but also when he plays sports. He's the guy that kind of waits in the sidelines. Uh, he would rather pass the ball on uh, to another teammate to make the score rather than being a, a showboat uh, you know i gotta win i gotta be the number one guy he's he's not that that type of uh, person at all very introspective about uh, who he is and the way he uh, operates through life okay so um mitch sabatis is also um uh, talking about some of his other uh, personality uh, traits. He uh, he's not a big uh, party kid. He doesn't uh, run out with the gang and do crazy things that high school kids do. He says, uh, you know, when asked to do to do that, he says, uh, "Hey, I'm cool, uh, but I'll catch you guys later." So uh, it's very kind of uh, laid back. Uh, he's not the uh, because of that, he's probably seen as not a popular, uh, but well likable, uh, student. He has a dual, uh, reputation of being a, a jock and a brainiac. And, uh, he, uh, as the story progresses, we, we get to feel both of those, uh, personality types uh, in him. So, uh, of course, a jock is just a slang expression for someone who is involved in sports, uh, usually meaning uh, low uh, intellectual ability. But in uh, Mitch's case, uh, he is both a jock 
and a brainiac, which means uh, he's well read. Uh, come to find out later, he's taking uh, advanced placement uh, courses. Uh, these are courses that are in the last couple years of high school. You uh, have an opportunity if you do well academically to take uh, college level courses. And this of course helps you to, uh, to go to college after you graduate from high school. So he is uh, kind of a contradiction uh, in that he's both uh, a sports guy and uh, he's also has uh, intellectual pursuits. Okay, so Jimmy T. Black comes in. He's the, everybody's kind of hanging around him, but we still have three other students that we uh, haven't met yet. And the, uh, the other student male is, his name is uh, Randolph. And he has uh, two sisters, uh, Coretta and uh, Rosa. And they're kind of uh, being left alone. Uh, no one's uh, rushing up to meet them. It's the first time that any, uh, uh, okay, so before we get to that, um, their name is uh, White. Um, Randolph White and his two sisters. And uh, Mitch says that that's a misnomer. So the irony of the situation is, is that the Whites are actually African-American. And there has uh, never been any African-American uh, students at the Long Pond uh, High School before. So no one is really sure how to approach them. Uh, even uh, Mitch uh, struggles with what to say uh, to introduce himself. And he's, he's uh, observing what other people are doing. He's doing his usual hanging back routine. And, you know, he's thinking, hey, come on, uh, guys, what's, you know, why are we all avoiding these uh, three new students? We should be welcome welcoming them uh, to our school. So he wonders what he should uh, say as an introduction. Maybe he should use some uh, African-American slang that he knows from rap music or whatever. Uh, but uh, he decides on just the local hello, which is uh, hiya. So he introduces himself to uh, Randolph just by saying hiya, and uh, they shake hands, and uh, he's surprised by the way that Randolph shakes hands. Now, usually high school boys, especially if they're jocks, uh, when you shake hands, you grab the other person's hand and squeeze as hard as you can to show how strong you are. But that's not, uh, that's not what happens with Randolph. Randolph shakes his hand uh, very gently uh, in the same way that First Nations people shake hands. So Mitch is kind of confused by that. He, uh, as he talks to Randolph, uh, Randolph doesn't use any of that uh, black ghetto rap language. He speaks uh, perfect standard English. The, uh, he describes the two sisters as being uh, easy on the eyes, which means they're very good looking, very nice to look at, uh, beautiful girls. Uh, they're tall, so he's already thinking, oh, the girls basketball team needs some new players. And uh, so uh, Randolph uh, becomes uh, his uh, new uh, best friend. And uh, Randolph is also a football player. Uh, Randolph uh, 
knows about Jimmy T, talks about some of the newspaper stories that he read from his uh, previous town about Jimmy T's uh, success as a football player. And uh, Randolph plays a position on the team called the center. And the center is a key player in the, uh, in the football team because he takes the ball and he, through his legs, passes it up to the quarterback. So he would be the center for Jimmy T eventually on the team. And Randolph is, uh, uh, he's the kind of player that uh, he's, uh, he's, he's short and, but very muscular and very strong. Um, he's very good at being center. The previous center on the uh, Long Pond football team was terrible. Uh, couldn't hike the ball correctly. The quarterback would have to reach way over to one side or jump up to grab the ball. But uh, Randolph is uh, uh, very good at uh, playing that uh, position. So uh, Mitch has not met Jimmy T yet. And he's looking and sees that Jimmy T kind of throws Randolph a dirty look. So I go, what's, what's this all about? So the story progresses. There is a tension between these two uh, new students, Randolph and Jimmy T. And we find out uh, later that uh, that tension comes from the parents. And we'll get into that in, in just a minute. Okay, so um, the uh, White's uh, father uh, is a doctor. And uh, he becomes the new director of the Long Pond Adirondack Interpretive Center. And uh, I should say the, the two sisters are dressed uh, beautifully. Uh, some of the other girls that are into fashion uh, quickly make friends with them. So they're being well, everybody's kind of intermingling now and, and that's going well. So um, the newspapers uh, come and take some pictures of the white family. And it's kind of a funny picture uh, under the headline, the head, uh, headlines are uh, Long Pond welcomes the whites. And it's a picture of an all black family. So ironic picture. And uh, so, the uh, father is a uh, is the new director. He's a doctor. The wife is also a professor at a local college. They're well off. He's being paid very well to be the uh, new director. They buy the best home in the lake area, right down on the lake, and come to find out that uh, Jimmy T's father uh, is the new uh, assistant director. So he would be working under uh, Dr. White. Uh, Dr. White would be the boss. And um, so the, the, the clash, the, the problems really stem from that uh, new uh, the new director and the new assistant director and uh, come to find out that uh, uh, both uh, Jimmy T's father and Dr. White were students together uh, back in college. They knew each other. Uh, okay, so um, everybody's met, uh, new friends, uh, the story proceeds, 
Um, Mitch Sebatis has uh, tried to uh, meet up with uh, with Jimmy T, but uh, Jimmy T just kind of disappears. Like he doesn't really want to talk to uh, to Mitch, and we don't know what that's about until later in the story. So, uh, as we proceed on, the uh, story talks uh, a little bit more about this, uh, why Jimmy T seems to be avoiding uh, Mitch. Uh, Mitch and Randolph become good friends. Um, there is some tension between the two uh, uh, actors in the story. Um, Mitch supposes that uh, the reason Jimmy T is avoiding him or is because he's friends with Randolph. Uh, he goes on to talk a little bit about the other uh, kids and population in the rural community that uh, have First Nations uh, ancestry. And um, they don't really uh, call attention to that. They, it's kind of a hidden fact. Uh, they just cut their hair and try to uh, integrate into the community and, and never really speaking about it. Okay, so um, again, there's another analogy to uh, Brunhilde uh, in the story. And he finally talks about uh, his father. So his father was uh, First Nations, uh, looked First Nations, uh, did get along with uh, everyone. He uh, had a good sense of uh, humor. People liked him. So uh, he was out uh, at a uh, local beer place, having a few beers with some of the locals. And it was a rainy night. And he leaves the bar and uh, is driving home. And he gets into an accident uh, with a big uh, truck and uh, it dies. So um, after that accident, uh, his uh, mother uh, takes uh, Mitch to Sweden and he lives over in Sweden for a year, which kind of puts him back a little bit in his studies when he returns to the States. So uh, this is where Uncle Tommy comes in, because uh, Mitch's mother uh, wants Mitch to know more about his dad and his father's uh, First Nations ancestry. And although not related directly, uh, Uncle Tommy uh, becomes the teacher of, uh, of Mitch for First Nations cultural uh, background. And uh, he uh, really is uh, important to, uh, to Mitch. Mitch ends up spending a, a lot of uh, time with him. Uh, they work together. And uh, he uh, very much uh, appreciates what Uncle Tommy's uh, wisdom uh, and stories uh, do to develop his uh, character uh, throughout that part of his, his life. So uh, they finally have their first uh, practice uh, on the field for football. And uh, we're introduced to the next uh, character uh, in the story, the coach, Coach uh, Carson. And uh, the coach uh, sees that uh, Jimmy T is really a, a great quarterback and that Randolph really knows his job to be a center. And finally, after many years of losing every game, uh, the football team has a chance to uh, actually win a few games with these two new uh, players. 
Okay, so um, eventually uh, Randolph and uh, and Mitch uh, developed their friendship because they're they're both in the uh, AP classes that we talked about earlier together. So Randolph is not only a jock, but he's also a, a very good student too, uh, just like Mitch. Um, even though there was uh, tension between Randolph and uh, Jimmy T, uh, when it came to uh, playing the game, uh, they worked well together. So um, the uh, after about a month or so, um, uh, Mitch has a chance to go to uh, dinner to meet uh, Randolph's uh, mom and dad. And which he does, he goes. And uh, Mitch uh, 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 talks a little bit about his uh, he, First Nations background. And Dr. White uh, says to uh, his son Randolph, could you uh, speak to Mitch in your language? And and Mitch is a little taken aback. What do you mean your language? So Randolph uh, rattles off this uh, very polite uh, uh, hello phrase in Cherokee, which is a First Nations language. And uh, Mitch is really shocked to hear this. Uh, come to find out that the uh, the Whites, their real name uh, before was uh, White Path. And uh, the name was shortened to White. And they're not uh, African American only. They are also uh, First Nations, uh, both the husband and the wife uh, have First Nations ancestry. So in uh, American history, we find that there was this uh, uh, intermingling of uh, runaway uh, black slaves that uh, when they escaped uh, slavery, a lot of them would uh, end up in uh, Indian villages uh, intermarrying. And uh, so there was this kind of mix of African-American and First Nations uh, together. The mother talks about a historical event uh, called the Trail of Tears, a very tragic uh, story in American history where this uh, Indian group uh, called the Cherokee were on the East Coast, had some really good farming land. Uh, colonial powers wanted it. Uh, they drove them off their land and sent them out to a reservation halfway across the country in Oklahoma. And of course, they had to walk uh, that thousand miles and many died along the way. And uh, it was interesting that uh, one country in Europe after hearing about this tragedy, uh, donated money uh, to the tribe uh, after they settled in their new reservation area in Oklahoma to help them with medicine and food and getting established. And that country was Ireland. So every year in the Cherokee tribe, Cherokee tribe pays tribute to Ireland for their uh, generous uh, donation and offer uh, back during the uh, Trail of Tears. Okay, so um, now Mitch realizes that Randolph too is First Nations, which makes their uh, friendship and bond uh, even stronger. Okay, so uh, it talks a little bit about uh, uh, Jimmy T. Yeah, Jimmy T is like a real true jock. Um, he, 
does the minimum, what's required to stay on the football team. He doesn't take AP classes. He does the smallest amount of work possible just to stay on the team. He's not a good student. Uh, this is not going to help him when he gets to college, but that's a that's another story. So time goes by. They're uh, starting to win some games. Uh, Randolph and Jimmy T, despite their uh, uh, problems uh, play well together on the field, except for one day during a, a practice. So kind of an argument uh, between uh, Jimmy T and Randolph. Now, Jimmy T says, calls Randolph a, a very bad uh, racial slur name. And he takes the ball and throws it as hard as he can at uh, Randolph. Now, Randolph is, he's, he's small, but he's very muscular. He's, he's, he, he's strong. And the ball hits Randolph in the chest and then bounces back and hits Jimmy T in the nose and Jimmy T is bleeding all over the place. So even though Jimmy T really makes this uh, very derogatory uh, remark to Randolph about being African-American, Randolph doesn't react. He doesn't, you know, these are not fighting words to him. All he says to Jimmy T is better than being a faker. Hmm. What does that mean? Uh, Mitch can't quite figure out what that's all about. Okay. So at the time, the coach is off the field. Uh, he comes out. He sees Jimmy T running back to the, uh, to the gym, uh, bleeding all over the place, uh, asks what's going on. Mitch covers the base, says, oh, he just got hit in the face with a ball and he'll be back out. Uh, no big problem. So uh, this is kind of the, uh, the, the, the climax point of the story in terms of the relationship between um, Randolph and Jimmy T. The tension has gotten uh, beyond uh, and now it's physical, okay. So uh, as the story progresses, we, uh, we are at a, uh, a game and uh, Jimmy T's father is uh, one of those guys that goes to the playing field and watches his son uh, play. And most people that, you know, that do that go see their kids play, just sit in the grandstands and watch the kids and clap uh, when they do well. And, and that's about it. But uh, Jimmy T's uh, father is uh, called a yeller. And he'll run up and down the field. He yells at the other players. He yells at the referee. He yells at the coach. He really, really tears into uh, Jimmy T, uh, saying, you know, things like, uh, you know, you missed that ball. What are you doing? Keep your eye on the ball. What's going on? You're playing terrible. I mean, this doesn't help a kid play better. OK. And in uh, sports, uh, almost uh, I wouldn't say every game, but we do see these kind of parents that uh, kind of take over the playing field and just, you know, it's a game, come on. I mean, you know, let the kids play, all right? But uh, Jimmy T's father is uh, one of those uh, unwanted uh, parents on the playing field that yell at everybody and 
take the game way too seriously. So we uh, finally uh, find out what the tension between uh, Jimmy T and Randolph is, and it stems from the the parents. The uh, there is a social engineering, uh, government enforced uh, program from the 70s to the 90s in America, where if you are, uh, two people are applying for the same position, but they are uh, equal. If you are from a minority group, you get uh, extra points and you uh, get the job. And this was the, it's called affirmative action. And this was the situation between uh, Randolph's dad and uh, Jimmy T's dad. Uh, they both applied for the directorship at the uh, Adirondack Center. Uh, Randolph's father got the job. Jimmy T's uh, dad thinks it was because of this affirmative action program. He thinks he should have been the director. And so that's the, the tension between them. It's, it stems from the parents. Okay, so in the final part of the story, a big game. They have to win this game. Uh, Jimmy T's the quarterback. He's not playing very well. His father is out on the field yelling at him very brutally. Uh, saying, oh, you'll never be anything. You're, you're just like your mother. You play like a little girl. All of this kind of stuff that is really kind of tearing up Jimmy T and making him play even worse. So they're losing. The team's losing. Uh, halfway through the game, there's always a, a break, a short break in between. And the uh, team goes off the field and kind of regroups uh, to make a plan for the second half of the game. So uh, they don't really say too much. Uh, they can see that uh, Jimmy T is all broken up on the verge of crying. And uh, the coach uh, comes up to Mitch and says, hey, uh, Mitch, uh, go talk to him, uh, straighten this thing out. And Mitch says, uh, why me? And th the coach realizes that the way that um, Mitch handles himself, he's really the, the leader. Uh, he's the guy that can be relied on to kind of put the team back together again. And he makes a comment to, to Mitch about, hey, come on, you know, you, you can do this. So Mitch takes uh, Jimmy T aside and, and he, he talks to him. And uh, uh, Jimmy T admits that he's, the reason he's been avoiding um, Mitch all this time is because he's not Native American at all. He just thinks it's kind of cool to dress that way. They've been traveling from school to school. The other kids seem to like it when he dressed as First Nations, but he's not. And he knows nothing about the cultural background. And he's been um, avoiding uh, Mitch all this time because he knew Mitch was a real First Nations guy and could easily expose him for being a faker uh, because uh, Jimmy T knew absolutely nothing about First Nations life. So uh, at the uh, the end of the story, uh, Mitch does uh, talk uh, to uh, Jimmy T, talks him into going back out into the game. Uh, somehow they play well. 
he promises that uh, he'll introduce uh, Jimmy T to his uh, Uncle Tommy Fox. And the end of the story, he says that, uh, uh, this is so, so true. He says, uh, you know, basically we're all human beings and all our blood is red. It doesn't matter who you are, or who you uh, project yourself to be at the end of the day, we're, we're all human. So that's kind of the, the moral of, uh, of our story. It took a long way to get here. But uh, anyway, it, uh, I found this to be a very interesting uh, story that uh, Joseph uh, Bruchek wrote. The story did come out. And he wrote it in uh, 2015, so not that long ago. And the time period of the story looks like about 1990s, about the 90s uh, in America. 